one and we're live we're recording hey Brad, so thanks for thanks for doing this thanks very much for having me on yeah it's the second first, yes yeah second time our second interaction less uh less nervous than before <laughs> i guess so yeah no that was a very interesting discussion that we had last time yeah i mean we i've had people uh, i've had friends and uh, and acquaintances come up and tell me i was like that that was a very interesting conversation with francis you should have her on again it's like yes. yeah, i'm thinking about it she's got a new yes. book coming out so, i'll try not to talk for too long no uh so what's the um this new book you got is uh separate but unequal separate yes that's right and it's separate just, but unequal how parallelist ideology conceals indigenous dependency and it just and, came out Yep, it came out last week. Uh, we had the launch for it on November 6th at Mount Royal. It was a very nice uh, event with uh, a number of colleagues um, saying some uh, nice things uh, about the work and myself, which was a nice uh, change from the usual. That I sh Actually, I shouldn't say that. There, There's a split. There's there's split opinions on my, uh, my participation and the discussions about Indigenous, non-Indigenous relations and other matters. Now that has to do with um, your your perspective or the position you take on this whole thing, right? Yes, and and uh, I was just thinking about this today. Is that I, I don't really fit very easily in the ongoing discussions about indigenous non indigenous relations because you have what I call the parallelist uh, position, uh, which is the nation to nation approach which is the dominant paradigm now in discussing indigenous, non-indigenous relations. But then the other view is the, um, I guess what would be considered to be a neoclassical econ uh, economics viewpoint, um, which largely focuses on the Indian Act and the, the obstacles that the Indian Act uh, imposes on the development of markets in indigenous communities, um, generally argues for privatization of various uh, aspects of the system, so um, so I'm I don't I don't accept either of those mm -hmm. positions, and and I think that Albert Howard and I are are really the only voices that are coming at it from a uh, historical and material uh, perspective. So it's it's it'll be interesting to see how this discussion unfolds. Mm -hmm. uh, if it does, uh, one tendency that does exist is just try to ignore uh, our our perspective so that's that's happened quite a bit over the last 10 years so i'm hoping that this will enable us to sort of restart the discussions on uh, some of the, the causes of indigenous dependency but we'll see what happens and when you say the um your work gets ignored is it that you call it um people working academics working in the same field um, tend to not engage with the work yes and i've actually heard people say that they intentionally don't cite our work really? um, they want to talk about it but they don't want to mention our names because Why is that? This, this would give us um you know uh publicity i guess and would result in you know people discussing it and we certainly don't want to have that happening um, you know, sort of ideas challenging the existing way people are thinking about this. So um, that that I have seen people say that. So uh, we'll see whether I'm hoping that there will be some reviews and discussion about it from an academic perspective, um, and this will then enable people to enter into that conversation. But but we'll see. I'm 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 still waiting to see the first discussion about it uh, at this point. Um, it's early days, I guess. So I, I, I think it has to kind of be covered in the media or something like that has to happen um, before it's discussed. Um, but we'll see. But so far, um, the only thing that did happen was, I guess it must have been after, just right after I talked to you, um, there was a person working in the bureaucracy in Indian Affairs in Ottawa who wrote a long diatribe to the University of Ottawa Press um, sort of suggesting that the book shouldn't be published and making all sorts of wild accusations um and uh, that that led us to have to you know sort of make statements that you know bullying on twitter is not going to lead the university of ottawa press to uh, 
pull it from publication. So, uh, so I was thinking at the time that this was going to be the beginning of something quite nasty, but um, that just sort of died away. So we're still, we're, you know, we're, I'm still waiting to hear um, some commentary on it. But of course, the book, I don't even know if the book has been fully stocked in, in various locations yet. So um, we're still in the early days of discussions about it. And the, so to get a, a like a synopsis of the book is you, your position is that parallelism has been a bad, almost uh, maybe a terrible thing for uh, uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada. Yes. Um, so parallelism, um, I guess it started in full with the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. Um, that's when it started to become dominant in discussions. And um, the book actually uses the, the final report of the Royal Commission as the basis for the discussion. Um, and what parallelism argues is that um, it's really the, uh, the theft of Indigenous lands and the obliteration of Indigenous cultures that is the source of all Indigenous problems today. So if the land, and I see this more and more now, that the lands should be returned back to Indigenous people and there should be all these processes which allow Indigenous people to assert control over all sorts of services um, and doing so will enable uh, indigenous people to become the nations that they are claimed to have been at the time of contact and this will allow them to become um, self-determining um, healthy societies as they were in the past so so that that's the nature of the argument but as I mentioned in this is the main part of the book is discussing that the nature of that theoretical perspective and then showing how that really doesn't consider the smaller size, the, the lower level of productivity, the simpler nature of the societies that existed at the time of contact. Um, so if you're going to try to rejuvenate things that existed hundreds of years ago, that's, that's not going to be something that's going to work in the modern context when you have you know, highly productive, highly complex nation states uh the indigenous people need to fit in with that globalized system it's not even just canada it's it's the entire world which is becoming an integrated political and economic system you know how is it that you know rejuvenating cultural features from hundreds of years ago is going to be able to do this and and what the ideology of parallelism does is that it disguises that developmental difference that exists exists between societies that are based on a hunting and gathering mode of production mm -hmm. and societies that are based upon an industrial, um, highly productive type of economic and political system. So there's a whole uh, hi history of economic, political, intellectual development that's completely ignored by parallelist ideology and, and disguised in various ways, which I document throughout the book. Um, especially important is the educational system, the yeah. difference in education that existed in hunting and gathering societies versus modern nation states, you know, scientific, uh, sci scientifically developed nation states, uh, you know, thousands of years of philosophy, all those developments that have happened throughout the whole world. Um, and parallelism pretends that you know, there were these scientific and philosophical uh, developments that existed within hunting and gathering societies, even claiming sometimes that we have a lot to learn mm -hmm. philosophically and scientifically from indigenous cultures, which is not substantiated in any way. Uh, that, that's never been shown to be the case. And in fact, what's being proposed is for educational programs in these communities is going to you know keep indigenous peoples isolated from um, the modern world basically surely the the people um, espousing this view surely they know that returning to their uh, indigenous people's previous state or whatever the the state in which they were at first contact is not good for them in in the sense that you know because of all the developments that have happened 
in, in our society, you would expect, um, I, I would think you would expect people to realize, okay, we were at this state, just like all other human tribes were at this state at one point, and then technology develops, ideas develop, you have cultures mixing, and then, you know, the, that all continues. But it just, it, it seems naive to me as someone who's not an expert in this field at all, but it just seems very naive to espouse the view that we should have two different kinds of cultures or like nations living side by side, pretending mm-hmm. that one nation, which is less developed, and this is not, a, it's not I don't say it in a, a derogatory manner, but it's just mm-hmm. less developed technologically, philosophically, politically, and then one which is very highly developed, you know, that they should yeah. live in existence with each, each other, pretending yeah. that both are going to be successful. Surely they know that. It's hard to it's hard to determine how much is um, opportunistic um, types of perspectives, which are just trying to involve themselves in these what I call the rent seeking efforts. So um, the neo tribal renterism, which is one of the main um, theoretical developments that is put forward in the book, is that uh, almost all of indigenous politics is about trying to obtain transfers from the government that, that that's that's or industry or various institutions and the parallelist ideology parallelist ideology is used as the justification for the dispersal of these transfers so it's hard to tell how much of this is just opportunism versus how much is an actual honest just romantic view of indigenous societies and and because there's no honesty at all in discussing this uh, this is the difficulty that that we're having is that um, if you try to raise these arguments Mm -hmm. which uh, albert howard and i were doing 11 years ago you you have a huge backlash that is leveled against you and most people don't you know just stay silent about it so it, it d- doesn't really come out as to how this this doesn't really make any sense and this is is, is inconsistent with the history of humanity um, um but indigenous people are uh, romanticized and and seen as being special so you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that uh, we're not are making this argument for any other society so you know when you have African or Asian students come to the university, you know, no one's talking about Asian science or, or African science. That's not happening. Everyone is understanding that science is a universal uh, development and all human beings can uh, benefit from it and contribute to scientific developments. But um, for indigenous people, we have what's called indigenous science. Mm -hmm which is not science at all it, it, it's well proto science maybe um, for some of it but most of it is, is is spiritual beliefs of indigenous people which are contrary you know actually contrary to science and and you know I've, I've gone to many talks where you know when you actually do a lot of this is very vague discussions and when you actually demand examples of what is being talked about you get ridiculous um, spiritual, you know, claims, spiritually based claims, which um, will not be beneficial whatsoever to any of the science courses that are being taught in universities. So um, it's it's hard to say uh, how much is opportunism and how much is romanticism that people have absorbed from, you know, wanting to help Indigenous people, well-meaning efforts to try to help Indigenous people, and thinking that by you know, sort of exaggerating the, um, you know, the development in Indigenous societies, this somehow is, is going to be beneficial to Indigenous people. Is the, um, this renterism, renterism idea is, it's, it's becoming more and more prevalent. Mm. Uh, I've, I've seen um, a, a lot more universities now acknowledging, uh, making land acknowledgement, and then there's yes. more, um, more, re- more recent, I saw, what was it? I forget what it was, some, some event that was happening and then uh, they, acknowledge, they did the land acknowledgement. And I've always wondered, okay, I don't really know why they're doing this. I mean, we have, we have, there are people that I know who are, who have told me that uh, this whole uh, land acknowledgement is to acknowledge 
uh, the spiritual, um, I don't know, what is it? I, I think it's like the spiritual connection to the land. Yes, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. And I thought, well, why, why do you need to make the land acknowledgement? I mean, especially, yeah. especially if the person making it is not in any form religious or anything, if they're, a, yeah. if they're an atheist, like, yeah, why would you even yeah. make the land acknowledgement? But I mean, but it's different though, because for you, you how would you where did this all come from this idea of this land acknowledgement that's taking over canada <laughs> yeah and and it's it's well the i i i think that the basis of it is is neo tribal renterism that that's the long term objective um so you get people to admit that the land doesn't belong to them and the land belongs to indigenous people and of course the obvious implication of that is that you should be paying rent because it's not your land, uh, so that's not the bait. That's at the that's that's behind it, but that hasn't come out yet. Um, what it's been sold as um, a way to bring about reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. So, so that's generally what most people think is that, you know, you're going to say this even though you don't quite understand what it means. Indigenous people seem to want you to do that. And so, therefore, to be a, a, a kind person who's trying to bring about reconciliation, you will defer to them and do what it is that, that they're demanding. But, of course, it, it's very dangerous to do things that you don't understand. Like, like this, this, is, this is a difficult road that we're going along instead of saying, you know, trying to figure out what this means before we're doing it. We're just thinking, well, we should just not you know if you in fact if you question it yeah yeah that shows that you are a, a person who's not doesn't want to engage in reconciliation so right. so it's kind of framed in a way which makes it very very difficult for people to say wait a second why are we doing this what are the potential implications of this so i think that almost everything that you see in indigenous politics is is neo-tribal renterism is is the nature of it um but it's often disguised with um, sort of this idea, things like reconciliation and, and trying to make amends for the past, all the, these sorts of things, which, which generally everyone, well, almost everyone is interested in doing, um, but, but that sentiment is being used by um, neo-tribal elites, lawyers, consultants, all these people who are brokers within, the, um, within this whole attempts to, to obtain transfers from the government. Uh, so I think that is a major insight which people are, don't, are not really understanding is this, this whole neo-tribal renterist processes that are behind most of these initiatives. What, what, can you explain what neo-tribal neo -tribal means? Yeah, so neo-tribal is um, referring to the changes that have happened in, in uh, indigenous societies by being incorporated into capitalism. And, and that's a big part of the book is taught is sort of tracing the development of capitalism in Canada and showing how changes in capitalism have transformed indigenous society. So indigenous societies today are not the same as they were in 1500, 1600, 1700. They've become what, what are called neo-tribes, which are stratified kin kinship-based forms of organization, which are um, shaped by the nature of, of capitalist processes. And um, originally, in, 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 when, in early, the, what's called the contact and cooperation phase, this is spelled out in the Royal Commission report, um, the, the type of capitalist development was the fur trade, and, and that was what was called a mercantilist type of capitalist system. And, and it really enabled Indigenous people to be participants in the expanding uh, economic system, which was, which was um, basically um, going across the country. When the fur trade declined, however, and Canada, the Canadian economy was making a transition from mercantilist economic system to uh, industrial economic system, uh, that required a transformation of productive processes and indigenous societies, because of their low level of, lower level of development, were, were not easily incorporated into the system and, and were generally sidelined and marginalized in you know unviable uh, they, they were seen as an obstacle to progress and, and were basically 
marginalized and unviable areas. And as a result of that, they, they, they weren't involved in productive processes. And so starting in, I guess, around the 1950s and the 1960s, when there was a push to try to uh, deal with the problems that were existing in indigenous communities, mm -hmm. that's when the legal profession became heavily involved in indigenous affairs and all the kinds of claims that are being made, the political claims that were being made weren't being made as producers, which, which is usually what happens is, is working class demands for better conditions. That, that's generally what happens uh, in, in the development of capitalism. This wasn't possible for indigenous, marginalized indigenous peoples. So lawyers stepped in and started making demands on behalf of indigenous organizations for transfers uh, from the government. And this really distorted indigenous societies. And this is the neo-tribal element. And you have a neo-tribal elite, which is heavily invested in these whole renterist types of schemes. Um, and that's what they're oriented towards. But the marginalized members of the communities are left out of this, what's called a circulation economy, okay. where these rents are circulated in the community and they largely go to the privileged members, the neo-tribal elites and their, their associates. The marginalized members um, are just becoming more and more left behind and don't get access to those transfers. And, and that's really what should be the focus mm. of indigenous policy, which is not, because all the focus is on, is on obtaining rent, um, which benefits lawyers and consultants and neo-tribal elites, but does not benefit uh, indig marginalized indigenous people. And even worse is a large part of neo-tribal rentierism is gaining control over the transfers, which are supposed to be devoted to indigenous education, indigenous health care, and indigenous housing. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that these funds get accumulated by the, the neo-tribal elite and, and, and the other elements of the indigenous industry, whereas the marginalized members have no access to that at all. And so they are in, in a much worse state, actually. They're becoming, their, their situation is becoming worse mm. as time goes on. And, and this is not understood at all in all the discussions. It's, there, this this, this neo-tribal character of indigenous communities is not understood at all. The, the elites are what, the chiefs? Yeah, so the chiefs, it can be at the community level. So if you see an indigenous community, there's a uh, indigenous leadership in the community okay. level. You got cut out. Okay, it's recording. Uh, this is going to be a very, we'll make it a very smooth transition. <laughs> Okay. So that yep. was my end. Uh, Francis was in the middle of talking, and then my headphones, which I didn't know had batteries, died. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we were talking about neo neo tribal elites, and the, yes. and the whole um, the whole thing that's going on. Yes. So and and really the the the, the major difficulty, which is, you know, the way out uh, for indigenous people of of the marginalization isolation, right. is having access to high quality services. But because uh, the nature of neo-tribal renterism is for neo-tribal elites to accumulate these funds for themselves and their associates, um, none of those funds get um, directed into what is required to be able to bridge this developmental gap to allow the isolated members of these communities to become um, productive members of society by entering into a wide range of occupations. And so this is this is something that needs to be addressed, which neither the neoclassical economics viewpoint about you know markets or the parallelist viewpoint about restoring nation to nation relations neither of those approaches are really addressing this this huge problem which does exist is is it um is it, there there are people i mean i should say there are people there there's a few people that i know that are uh, living in uh, indigenous I don't know, communities up way up north. Yes. And they tell us about how much problems that they're having. You know, like, yeah. can, like water. I think one of them is like water. And obviously the, the yeah. most obvious one is um, the alcohol problem. That yeah. Uh, yes. I'm assuming it's all tied in to this whole thing. Like yes. Is, there's, uh, are they symptoms of this um, this problem? This uh, yes. parallelist 
yes okay. yes so you know the communities um to begin with the, the creation of these communities were they didn't emerge out of being the basis of any kind of economic activity um so so there is there's no economic reason for these communities to be there um and that creates a huge difficulty as to what to how to address these circumstances um so everything that you see is is trying to grapple with that very difficult problem and and it's often easier just to, to continue on with what's been happening so um to say okay well let's just put more transfers in there we'll try to you know provide more mental health services we'll try to improve the housing you know th these sorts of things which you know can be helpful to some extent in that it can alleviate some of the worst you know crisis uh, types of elements but the foundation is still there mm. and and it really it can it really cannot be addressed under the current uh, the way in which this is this is happening um and and i i do talk about this at the end of the book you know what what is to be done about it and and it, it's not it's not going to be an easy way forward um but in order to try to grapple with it we need to be able to talk honestly about the situation and and that's not that's not happening so there's this kind of pretense that these what is are perceived to be nations can be restored somehow that's the by, by returning the land and by increasing the transfers and by giving indigenous leaders more control that will somehow you know result in 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 improvements when that that's not possible it, it's a completely impossible situation and um it's it's not clear as to how things can be uh, resolved but certainly honest discussions that that's what's required first and and that's what the my book is is doing to some extent is is saying you know all these um inventions that are happening about you know indigenous science and mm -hmm. um indigenous nations and all all these things which are invented that that's just disguising the difficulties which are going to have to be faced and and i guess there's you know two major difficulties one is the you know the educational deficits but the other is the communities themselves which you know really there is no future in those communities that they they are that they don't have any role to play within canada like they don't they don't there's no reason for them to be there except as from a humanitarian standpoint that we we really can understand that um for people who have grown up and and who have lived there for generations that's not that, that that's their home and, and that's places that they're attached to mm -hmm. and and uh, and i do draw the parallel of what happened in newfoundland and in, in i guess the 50s that that's an interesting parallel what happened? um the fishing industry started to decline in in newfoundland and they had all these outports there are hundreds of outports based upon the what was the fishing industry but of course, with modernization and, and increasing levels of services and educational programs, trying to provide services to these isolated outports mm. was, was not going to be possible. So Joey Smallwood, who was the premier at the time, um, uh, and uh, he he proposed, you know, basically encouraging people who lived in these outports to move to larger centers and to phase out the outports. And, and it was not done. It was not an easy situation a, a lot of the elderly the older people were very very unhappy and felt that you know that they had lost their way of life and and interestingly the the charge was made uh, of cultural genocide against the Newfies. people in Newf newfoundland like that they were we were culturally uh, you know obliterating the outport culture um but it was it's sort of been recognized that it was better for the young people Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to have this happen because mm -hmm. then they were able to access education and and um, a life that was more integrated and had more opportunities to you know maybe you know 
move to the cities or move you know elsewhere where there were economic opportunities so so that that's that's a parallel but it's going to be much more difficult for in, the indigenous population than it was for the, the for for those people in newfoundland because indigenous people have been much more isolated um there's a lot more uh, health problems uh, fetal alcohol syndrome i guess being the main one which is something which has not really been discussed very much um, mm. we don't know the uh the amounts there but it, it's and it's 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 at least 25 percent probably but probably higher uh, fetal alcohol syndrome rates in these remote communities because which is understandable since the circumstances are are, are so terrible for people uh, this is how they cope with the situation uh, but you know this is another thing that has to be addressed um, and as well the, the terrible distrust obviously uh, from being manipulated for so long and you know all the things that have happened uh, you, you you don't have a lot of trust so uh, trying to think through these things and and i i don't i don't really i i don't have the answer in terms of you know the magic bullet but certainly the rent seeking and opportunism and you know siphoning off of money to all these privileged elements and lawyers and consultants and so on for for discussions which have no benefit at all um that that's something that really needs to be recognized and talked about and how this is not a viable way forward uh so so that that's 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 what i'm hoping is that there will be some recognition of the unviability and destructive character of what what is being proposed uh and you know in the universities as as we talked about in our last conversation uh indigenization is one of the major initiatives at universities and and this is part of this whole denial like it, it, it's this whole a whole bunch of people pretending that the way we're going to solve indigenous educational problems is by indigenizing the university which it, it that's not that's not the the cause of the the, the the fact that we have terrible educational problems for indigenous people is not because of a lack of indigenization in mm -hmm. universities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um it's because of the low educational levels and the lack of scientific um, background and literacy and all the things that you need to be able to be successful in the educational system but instead of talking about that we're talking about how you know we should do land acknowledgements and how we should um, you know indigenize science courses by right. sending biology students to camps to talk to elders and and we should have indigenous studies with all sorts of you know cultural uh, indoctrination that goes on you know all these sorts of things which which is is just totally avoiding uh, the discussion which has to happen hmm. do we know how many uh, indigenous communities there are in Canada in terms of um where they're uh in terms of um actual like places that they're in like how many of those communities there are in canada we do um it's a bit complicated because you have the what's called the first nations okay uh which are um i think there's 633 um which are you know sort of designated First Nations, which are part of the Assembly of First Nations. So, but then there's other reserves which are part of that. So, let's say over six, you know, over 600. And of course, then the remote communities in uh, Nunavut, for example. Yeah. Um, so that's the same sort of thing. It's it's different in that it's in, encapsulated within Nunavut, but it, it's the same problem which exists in those communities. They're isolated and they they have no economic base. Mm. Um, I believe that 75, at least 75% of those communities, you know, have less than 500 people in them. So, so the size is a bit of a measure of this. So okay. um, you have uh, communities which are close to urban centers and, and those have much more uh, possibility, although still, because they're kind of these segregated types of setups, there there's dysfunctional characteristics in those communities as well but but you you are close enough to a city where those that can get out 
can get out. But if you look at, you know, a, a remote fly in, fly out community, there, mm -hmm. there's no way out of, of those communities. So, yeah. so that's, that's a much more serious situation. So there's, there's a lot, um, you know, over 600 of these communities, um, which, you know, have serious problems. Um, and the more remote and the more isolated, the more serious the problems uh, that exist, uh, which of course goes, according to parallelist logic, those are the ones that are, you know, have the most hope for the future because they're the ones that are going to be able to retain their culture and connection to the land and all these sorts of things, keep out the, you know, the corrupting modern influences out of their, you know, their cultural, uh, you know, uh, integrity and, and so on. So, yeah, so, so that's, 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 those are all things which, which are, they, there's statistics and there's a lot of, there's a lot of information on that, but, it's never looked at from the perspective of the, deg the degree of integration. Mm. So, so, so that's the key. The, the more integrated, the better off, which of course is contrary to how right. we're looking at it right now. Uh, yeah. So, there seems to be, in my mind, uh, a contradiction between thinking that we can we can have two separate nations coexisting and then requiring one of the nations to provide resources and other I don't mm. know, amenities for yeah. this other nation it just seems yeah. kind of contra con contradictory to yeah to espouse that view um well the, the 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 perspective the parallelist perspective is that these transfers will be what is used to jump start national development i see you know, okay. it's sort of this idea that if you just put enough transfers and enough land, you, ret well, you return the land and then you have these large monetary settlements and that is going to jumpstart economic development. That, that's, that's sort of the theoretical position, which makes no sense if you look at it from an economic perspective, because just because you put, put money into a, a community doesn't mean there's going to be a market mm -hmm. uh, for people to be able to produce things and other people to be able to buy them like right. that th those are not the same things but there, there's a lot of confusion with the, and, and this is the neo-tribal rentierism theory that i uh, that i'm trying to develop in various contexts is that it, it's a it's what's called a circulation economy so and 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 it's not just indigenous communities there's a whole literature on this um it's called the rentier state theory it, it has a lot of insights that's what i took uh from that literature, as well as you know, uh, Elizabeth Rada's uh, The Political Economy of Neo-Tribal Capitalism. Well, and then there's the, the, and I combine that with the rentier state literature, which is looking at uh, Middle Eastern uh, oil rich countries, mm. which don't, which just get uh, oil revenues. And so what you see is that, you know, these, what's called neo -tri what I would call neo-tribal elites, the, the sheiks, they get they gain control over these oil transfers and then they distribute they they circulate those those funds amongst their close associates and it's the same kind of uh situation that exists but it's oil money as opposed to uh, government transfers um and of course they they aren't as isolated they're they're much more integrated with the global economy so it, it, there's differences but it, it tends to have the same kind of set up as you see in in any kind of any kind of economy that is that is um that exists because of of, of transfer externally developed transfers not think not because of production within the society right. so you know that's used you know historically that's how political systems have developed is that there's a you know people are producing things they're exchanging things um you know, capitalism emerged out of that, and and so you have a, a working class that develops and that becomes um, politically developed and and co cohesive, um, and and that develops a vibrant kind of uh, system, as opposed to one that's isolated and is just you know trying to accumulate you know, get get more and more transfers devoted to it, uh, and and this is this this tends to develop a very reactionary political system as well in these these types of rentier state political systems because you know everyone's trying to get 
their hands on the rent. So they're all kind of competing with one another to get their hands on the rent, as opposed to, you know, cooperating in labor struggles against um, the owners of the means of production. So that's kind of the historical and materialist uh, kind of nature of the theory that I'm working on as well. How much? Okay, so assuming that, uh, uh, okay, hypothetically, let's just say we, um, we continue on doing these land acknowledgements, right, in Canada, mm. and, and then we do this for another 10 years. And then eventually we get to the point where we're like, okay, it doesn't really belong to us, so we're going to give you some rent. Now, mm. how much, or how much, uh, how much of, are we talking all of, all of Canada that, uh, are we saying these, uh, these, um, I don't know whether these neo, neo tribal elites slash parallel parallelist um, academics are they saying that all of Canada is uh, unacknowledged land that it 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 rightly belongs to First Nations slash Indigenous people? Well, they're they're trying. The lawyers are trying to make a legal case for that. So so you have lawyers working for Indigenous organizations. And each indigenous organization is trying to make as as much of that claim as they can. It's more difficult for some areas than for others. Um, so, for example, British Columbia is the hotbed of this because, and I believe also in the East Coast as well, because the kinds of treaties that were signed. Um, well, I believe in the East Coast they were called peace and friendship treaties, and so now the argument is is that wasn't a about session of like giving up land and so on. So all these legal cases are being reopened. And in the West Coast, of course, there were no real treaties that were signed, or at least it's the courts have determined that. So now it's just open season trying to say, okay, the whole thing is indigenous, you know, unceded indigenous territory and, and trying to make a legal case for that, which of course is, is not going to be, uh, Vancouver is not going to be mm-hmm. given back, but, the idea is not that. The idea is is that because you never really uh, solidified your claim, the crown never solidified its claim to the land underneath Vancouver. Therefore, this comp, you know, this transfer to make up for that has to be given to all these indigenous groups. So, so, so that's really what it is. It's making a legal case for increasing the amount of transfers that are going to be made to indigenous groups. And of course, the lawyers. That's why the lawyers are into this, mm. is that they get a huge cut out mm. of any of these things. Okay. So, and you see that with that's the other area of neo tribal renterism, which is the um, residential schools, the '60s yeah. scoop, um, the child. Well, this is the latest one, which just happened, I guess, a month ago or so. Child welfare, uh, you know, incompetence. Uh, so all these problems with child welfare. Yeah. The Human Rights Tribunal has just awarded, I think, forty thousand dollars for every child who's been in care. So, you know, yeah. So these these large, I believe, it's billions of dollars. And so the government's fighting it now because they don't want that to be a precedent for future all the other child welfare things. But no one getting into all these discussions. No one realizes that's not going to do anything to solve the mm-hmm. terrible child welfare crisis that exists like all this money you know everyone wants to get forty thousand dollars so no one's obviously going to complain about that and the lawyers are very happy because they're going to get a huge cut out of that um but in the end you give forty thousand dollars to someone and they spend it on a bunch of stuff but they still have these terrible health problems and and educational pro you know and all these the communities are still the same so nothing ever moves forward it's just creating the foundations for another legal dispute which is going to go through the same motions and distribute more you know so this is what is keeping on going on and on and on instead of people saying you know this isn't this is not the way to address the terrible circumstances Uh, you know that that is needs to have some much more well thought out strategy developmental strategy for improving the services in mm. these communities, which would give, you know, at least provide some basis for integration because you would be giving people more background, which they could then, you know, use to 
understand things more. Um, but but the, the, the gap is so wide, you know, that, that's the kind of frightening thing is you start thinking about how to do this in, in these remote communities and, you know, there, there's really no, nothing there that provides the basis, the foundation for this to happen. So, you know, this is a massive problem. So you can sort of see why governments say, well, we'll just send more transfers and we'll let the indigenous elites deal with it since they're the ones who are clamoring to control these transfers anyway. Right. Um, but it just creates more, more and more disparities and, and more and more social problems. Um, and, and that's that's kind of where we are at this stage. But but no one is kind of saying, hey, you know, this is neo-tribal renterism. This will not address the problems. It's just delaying things and, and things are getting worse because of it. This, it, this seems like we're applying bandages instead of actually dealing with the, yeah, yeah. the problem that there is. Yeah. It, but um, going back to the um, to the um, the rent the renterist mindset, I mean, if we're trying to go back, I mean, it, if if the the uh, the neo tribal elites are trying to get back to uh, the state in which they were in, isn't it? Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, isn't it? Con- what is the, it? It seems contrary again to think that if you that the uh, that the uh, the treaties that they sign are legitimate if like the if they're trying to get back to a state in which uh, the. What was it called? Before the Brits came and the French people came. Yeah. Why, why are we considering the treaties as legitimate if. I'm sorry, why do they consider the treaties to be legitimate things to be fought over if they're trying to return to a state in which there were no treaties? Um, well, I think they would say that the treaties are the mechanism which will enable them to revitalize okay. that relationship. So, and, and it's, and it's the way in which it's, it's um, put forward is in terms of relationships that exist between states. So that's how the treaties are seen. So it's kind of seen as an international relations mechanism. And, and this is usually the analogy that's drawn, but, but that's not really how the treaties were uh, perceived at that time. You know, the treaties were trying to deal with um, you had a British legal system that required this, and you had an unusual situation because you had, you know, these groups that were basically dependent, like they weren't, they weren't at the same level of as develop of development as existed in other situations when treaties were signed. So the treaties were kind of imported as a as a mechanism that was was something that could be used, but but they 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 weren't analogous to treaties that were signed between states so but but the industry the aboriginal industry um has kind of they they're trying to pretend that that's the same thing and so then they say okay well these treaties must be respected and then by respecting the treaties that will give these nations what they call nations um the ability to you know have assert political control over their affairs and and that's the first step in them being able to restore what's perceived to be this cooperative relationship, which of course was based on the fur trade at that time, which is not the same system that exists right now. So that's part of my historical analysis is, is saying, there's this pretense that you can just restore the, these original relations, this original relationship when the conditions are completely different. So th- that doesn't make any sense, but, um, you know, the, these things have not really been investigated in a very uh, critical way uh, because everyone just wants to agree with whatever the indigenous leadership says. Like that, that seems to me to be what happens is that um, you know, every, everyone's everyone's nervous about you know criticizing what an indigenous leader says. So right. you 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 tend to you know defer to, and that this is part of the strategy is um, you know. In non-indigenous people have screwed things up so badly for indigenous people. It's time for indigenous people to take control. Like that, that sort of rhetoric. Um, when um, that doesn't necessarily mean indigenous people are going to be able to the leadership 
knows what it's doing and is it going to be able to do it and in fact it seems to be profoundly self-interested and and just attempting to siphon off rents for itself and, and doesn't really display very much mm. interest in the marginalized members of the communities anyway um so uh, these are a lot of different matters but but i think that that's the idea behind the treaties is that that was kind of the original sovereign relationship and by respecting the sovereignty that that's kind of the path to um restoring these beneficial interactions i still find it, um i still find it weird that the uh i think this was in 2016 or 2017 uh there was an article in global mail and it was talking about how uh this was i think this was about um the missing indigenous women and Mm. girls yes and it's talking about that and one thing in this article, this is a this is for a graduate philosophy class that i was taking and the, our prof was showing us this article and she was like okay what do you guys think of this article and in the article it stated that um uh that that our prime minister i mean it's still the prime minister now i guess uh our prime minister uh put in together uh, put uh, a group of um judges together uh canadian you know educated ju- judges but then he wanted indigenous judges as well but they couldn't find or at least in the article that said that they couldn't find uh lawyers or indigenous lawyers who could do these things so then they uh got leaders from the tribe uh, from the uh from the from the from the groups and one thing that really shocked me when i re- when i read this was not that that was kind of strange was that they agreed that one of the ways in which a witness could present their you know their what's the, what's the state uh, the, their state their statement was through dance mm. and yeah. i thought and i was reading this and i was like i don't know if this is a joke or so you know we had this discussion i to this day i think about that mm. i think about okay you know if we're trying to really help the the indigenous peoples the first nations why do we entertain some of the ideas which seem um undev- underdeveloped yeah yeah well this is the you know it's it's relativistic thinking too which should be mentioned i do discuss this in the book um postmodern relativism yeah which has taken over the universities and to some extent um you know the law schools um which really sort of which which is you know opposes the idea of evolution and development and so the idea is is that indigenous legal traditions are just another way of you know organizing a a system of justice um which is this you know equally developed and the same when um indigenous societies historically uh uh hunting and gathering societies the the type of there was no there were no there was no legal system like that that's a you know saying that would cause consternation amongst everyone saying well, what they they obviously had you How know but you but laws that? you know you need to have laws that are um Uh, written down and uh they are have a state that you know in you know legitimate coercion all these kind of political science concepts um that that didn't exist there mm-hmm. so so what you had were kinship relations and and kind of customary types of interactions which which were very arbitrary depending upon the power imbalances and so on that existed so if you were a powerful family and you uh you know did something which was disapproved of by the other families if they they didn't have the power to oppose you you could you could get away with you know murder or, or all these other aspects and and of course um blood feuds and vengeance and so on were were a major part of of interactions on this in terms of this so um so and that's and that's not just indigenous societies it's it, it's been well documented through for uh you know the vikings the vergeld was the 
you know, that was the nature of interactions in tribal societies. That, that's the nature of it. That's, that's pre-law societies. So, um, and there's a lot of discussion of this in my book. It's quite complicated uh, in terms of, you know, the characteristics of what, 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 what you need to have in place in order to say that a group is, has, has laws that are being applied to the entire society and enforced by a state. Um, so all this kind of evolutionary thinking about legal systems is, is completely absent in these discussions. And, and you have a lot of just, um, you know, m largely made up things that are being acted out. And if, if you had to bring them into, if you had to actually implement them, it would be very dysfunctional mm -hmm. within the system. And, and you do see that in the communities when you have, you know, what's called community justice initiatives, which essentially is the, the powerful members of the community intimidating the, you know, the people who don't have any power to go along with whatever it is that they want, you know. That's sort of the nature of it. Um, but because, you know, thinking about it in an evolutionary way is, is really off limits. Okay. Um, you get of, trapped. You get right. trapped into saying, well, I can't really object to this because I'm coming at it from a, you know, a Eurocentric viewpoint. Of course. And they're coming at it from an Indigenous viewpoint. And who am I as a, you know, as a European-based, et cetera, et cetera. How am I, you know, how can I judge you know, within this sort of postmodern relativist kind of position. So, so uh, because we refuse to accept the theory of cultural evolution in any of these discussions, mm -hmm. everything just becomes very relativistic and right. whatever an indigenous person says must be true. And how can I judge it anyway, since I'm not indigenous? So just let them do whatever it is that they're demanding to be done uh, without any kind of analysis uh, attempt to have some kind of universal analysis of what this is going to mean within the Canadian context. So uh, this is this is pretty much what's been happening over the since the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. We've been going further and further down this road without anyone saying this, this doesn't make any sense and uh, this isn't going to work within the modern context, uh, right. but, but that, that ha we haven't really come to that realization yet. Um, so hopefully, uh, at least with, uh, you know, this, the book that's just, my book that's come out, at least this will be one perspective, this will be putting forward the case about this, and then everyone can kind of take a look at that and then make arguments against it, if, if they're not wanting to completely ignore it, uh, right. which is, I guess a potential like, possibility is this this um, this postmodern relativism. It really affects the way we interact with cultures mm. now, because there's there's been an increase in um, cultural appropriation accusations just flying mm. around everywhere. Yeah, and I find it so strange because, I mean, it it's it seems pretty obvious that. The way a culture develops is by sometimes you're stealing ideas. You're outright stealing yeah. ideas. But it's, it's, no one really has a right to culture. I, at least in my opinion, that no one, no one can say, oh, this is our cultural idea that you can't take because that culture itself has taken many, many other ideas from other cultures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and over. again, uh, it's rent, this is all about rent-seeking behavior too. It's not, you know, sure, you can, uh, they, they want to, you can have this, uh, you know, painting style if you pay, you know, if you pay rent for it. Um, and a lot of it is, um, I remember this, this, this is when I first thought, like I'd heard about cultural appropriation quite a lot, but this is the first case I thought, oh, this is obviously rent seeking. Um, a woman in 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 Toronto uh, had started painting in the what's called the woodland style, which was a she was non-indigenous and was painting in the indigenous uh, style of, of the woodland flat. style. That's um, no, Norva uh, Moriso is the the okay. originator indigenous, but of course he would have he he studied other painter. You know he he just didn't wake up one morning and and that was that was inherent with him within him he had studied other painters so his mm -hmm. woodland style was a 
was a, had appropriated all sorts of things himself. But um, but anyway, he developed this. is quite it's quite uh, uh, unique and, and looks you, you can you can you notice it when you see it. Anyway, she was she she really liked it and was yeah. just taking it to do new things with. And people said, oh, well, you can you know she shouldn't have this showing this white person. Um, you know, showing her paintings and the, and it should be an indigenous person who has this showing. So that, that's a way for in, people who, who identify as indigenous to get the gallery space and, and yeah. get the showing. And, and this is now happening with literature all over the place. Mm. So, you know, you, in order for you to have a book that is going to be published, um, you know, it's good to be, have this indigenous identity and that's going to make it, people will then want to give you space for your book. And so there's a lot of, it's economically driven, a lot of this is. Mm -hmm. But getting to your point, it is a very destructive to humanity. It, it, this idea is very destructive because that is how art flourishes, is by looking at other experiences and other artistic um, you know, forms of expression and then developing on those to create something new like that that's what you know every you know if you look at the you know the rolling stones and their use of um you know blues uh, that that was how rock came as music and then you look at the um picasso and how he incorporated african element you know this is this is this is what artistic development is all about and to, to have people constantly worrying now mm -hmm that oh well i guess i shouldn't do that because then i'm going to get all this flack mm -hmm. from whatever group is claiming that i'm stealing their culture uh, that this is going to put a massive uh, break on any kind of artistic development and, and i find the whole thing is just so reactionary and mm -hmm. um divisive and it's gonna it just is terrible and and i'm amazed when i just hear people arguing about it i i'm and i'm, I'm seeing a lot of it's true i on social media especially you know every day someone's getting castigated for do, doing something and I, I think wow you know this is just so narrowly focused and and this is not beneficial you know and of course um it, it's okay the, the way cultural appropriation arguments are working now is that it's fine for indigenous people to appropriate aid from everyone else. It's just that everyone else can't appropriate from them. So there's this whole kind of intersectional hierarchy of, mm -hmm. you know, victims and oppressors and the, the people who are most victimized can appropriate the most. That's because right. They're at the bottom. <laughs> and then the people who are the most oppressive are not able to appropriate at all. And it's just, it's, a, it's, it's amazing how much steam it is. And, you know, I sort of thought that it was going to, I, I just feel I almost want to just completely mock it all the time. I just find it so absurd. Um, I thought it was gonna because I remember there was a uh, a big controversy that happened when um, a, a, an editor for a magazine made fun of it and wanted to have a cultural appropriation prize. Oh, that was uh, and, what's his name? Andrew something, right? From yeah, Nev Nevicki, I think his name was, and and, ah. and everyone jumped on board. And started laughing and, and saying, "Yes, I'm. I'll donate, you know, fifty dollars." And yeah, yeah. and I thought, "Wow, at least finally we're we're just joking about this. this. Is this ridiculous idea that should be mocked?" And then there is this this huge yes. blowback, oh, and every you know a whole bunch of people lost their jobs, and people had to get sensitivity training. And oh, and I remember Jesse went. He's a I didn't even know he was indigenous because I, I actually did quite enjoy his things. And then he starts becoming this cultural appropriation warrior, you know, wag, uh, you know, finger wagger. And he goes on CBC and starts crying about how people don't, you know, this is just the worst week he's ever had that this has all happened. And, and I thought, and so then it got set back instead of, you know, everyone just realizing it was ridiculous. We, we became more, afraid of it you know it, it kind of solidified itself more so so the things are you know that's very uh, that's kind of a, a an ominous sign that mm -hmm. you know the first attempts to you know poke poke fun at this ridiculous idea yeah. were just met with this storm of outrage and um, punishments and and that just made everyone kind of put their head you know you, you know sort of yeah, flagellate themselves more and, and you know cower more and say yes yes we were very mistaken we apologize 
Um, so if, anyway, yeah, this is this is really it's becoming. I, I'm amazed every day. I see these, this cultural appropriation stuff <laughs> we talked about. It, it's it, it's so crazy to me because when that whole thing happened, there was um, there's someone that I, I I know who wrote who writes for one of these big papers, mm. and he was on the cultural appropriation warrior finger wagging side. Yes. And I was so surprised. I was like, what are you doing? Yeah. You're a smart guy. Like, why are you? Why are you? Up? But he was just going yeah. on and then accusing uh, the guys who were all on board about the cultural appropriation prize. They're like, oh, these guys are all racist. Yeah. Uh, they're part of the patriarchy. They're very, um, what's the word they use? Uh, white. I forget something, something white. Mm. It's so funny because I, I, for a long time, I thought, okay, cultural appropriation is going to die. Everyone's going to, just mm. like you, I thought, you know, it's a very stupid idea. You know, mm. if people just learn a bit of history, they'll realize, oh, yeah, this is cultural appropriation is, is the norm. Of yeah. course, I understand if someone's like out there, you know, uh, shout out to uh, Justin Trudeau who, for, for <laughs> saying to wearing blackface. You know, if, if you're doing something like that, it's like, okay, you probably shouldn't do that. But other than that, if you're doing, you know, if you're taking, if you decide, I love Indian food start cooking indian food but you're white yeah yeah what's wrong with that oh no you can't do that because uh yeah. you're part of the dominant society and dominant societies can't take from yeah and it, i don't I, it's like the the whole rationale behind it is is so confusing um I, you know i i, I you know you you, you use the example about eating indian food which you know i assume that's okay still Right. Like, I assume oh. it's OK to do that under this current mm. logic. That's but maybe it isn't like me, like, under the, uh, you know, if, if, if I'm told I'm, I'm waiting just to be lectured and told you're not supposed to do that anymore. Like, that's mm -hmm. about where, where we're at here. Um, and, it may, and, it's, and it's just instead of uh, realizing that, um, you know, this is part of human history, this is part of us becoming a global species. Um, it's like we've all got to get into our own little groups again. Yeah. Protect our, uh, you know, our what's what's ours against anyone stealing it. You know, and and I I do see um, sometimes I can see how if you've and that this happens in music all the time. Uh -huh. You know, someone writes a song with a, a particular. Uh, chords arrangements and so on and then they're being sued because they're they're claiming someone else copied it mm -hmm. um you know it's 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 capitalism that is you know this is part of the problem with capitalism is that it it make it turns art into a commodity mm -hmm. instead of mm -hmm. art being something which is is going to be able to be able to enhance everyone and and is not owned by anyone so so really all this ownership and so on is is sort of destructive so it, that, that's kind of got a capitalist logic behind it and and indigenous um artists and so on are, are saying i you know i kind of want a piece of that um you know that ability to to charge for my whatever my ideas are but and so i i, I think that there is uh there's a, a wider context for that but still um it, you just wonder when when is it going to end but i i think it's it's very destructive to artistic development, this kind of mentality. And uh, we're I think we're seeing that a lot. I would be surprised if very soon people start accusing each other of cultural appropriation in regards to food. You know, right? We have mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. um, yeah. there's, there's this, I, I still can't believe that this is a legitimate story. Mm -hmm. There's a woman on BC who uh, claimed that white people she's an indian uh, descendant she said white people shouldn't be cooking uh uh food uh making bone broth in this very specific manner that she was doing mm, because yeah. indian and no one else has the right to do it and so she opened up a restaurant or a mm. truck shop or something to reclaim what was taken from her it's like mm. you weren't even born in india you know she was yeah. born here yeah I, so uh, it, it wouldn't be surprising if, you know, if there's a particular way indigenous people cook food, and I'm mm. sure that they do. Yeah. And yeah. If someone went out there, enjoyed it, they're like, hey, let me go back. They're like, oh, you can't do that, you know. Well, you have to pay. That's yeah, the thing. Okay. You it's have to pay for it. <laughs> I think that's behind most of this is, you know, seeing other people, you know, and that was the claim 
you know, and you sort of do understand that the Rolling Stones or Elvis or, you know, they make millions of dollars off of these, this, you know, blues basis. And the person who, you know, originated that didn't, didn't get anything, you know, this is kind of the argument. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, so you, on one level, you can sort of understand why that would cause resentment. But on the other, in looking at the wider cultural and human development angle, you know, that's what allowed all those great Rolling Stone songs to be created. Like that, mm -hmm. that's what, and that's, that's benefited everyone that we be able to have that kind of um, combination that, that happens. So, um, you know, these are, com but I, I do think uh, I, I, after the, the, that thing with the, the cultural appropriation prize yeah. and that didn't, that, that didn't slow it down and in fact accelerated it. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I just sort of sit back and watch it all. And, and, and don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I can't, I, I, I just can't take it seriously. I find it's just absurd arguments. Is um, the truth and uh, the truth and reconciliation that um, I, well, I don't know if it's called a paper or a book or the oh, commission, the report, the, the report? truth and reconciliation commission. What are your thoughts on that? I wanted to ask you the last time yeah. you were on, and I never got around to it. But I, what are your thoughts on it? And yeah, what are your thoughts on it, just generally? Yeah, so I think it's it came out. It's a, you know I I it's discussed you know somewhat briefly and because it's it's a huge like the royal commission report was an enormous report there's four thousand uh, pages right yeah mm -hmm. which is you know what i spent most of my time on yeah. um the truth and reconciliation commission was actually recommended by the royal commission so these things pile on one another and then of course the murdered and missing indigenous women yeah. inquiry was recommended by the truth and reconciliation commission so um these things are all rent seeking okay. exercises so it's part of neo-tribal rentierism. And um, actually, uh, there's a book coming out. It's going to be in a few months, I guess, by Rodney Clifton and Mark DeWolf, which is criti um, criti criticizing, it's an edited volume, okay. criticizing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And I have two chapters in there, which is okay. talking about um, the neo-tribal rentierist character of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is... Um, you know the methodology that was used by the truth and reconciliation commission was was sort of encouraging indigenous people to see the residential schools as a as this terrible traumatic uh you know culturally genocidal uh mm -hmm. type of uh institutions that's how it was uh, that was how people were encouraged to see it this way um, because of the money that could be, and this is the money that could be extracted from that, seeing it in that way. And there was, you know, $5 billion that lawyers were able to uh, demand on, on the basis of, of, you know, this kind of way of, of thinking about things. Um, and, and that's not to deny the terrible abuse and everything that did happen mm -hmm. and um, sexual abuse and physical abuse and so on. And, and also as well, um, you know, the, the neglect that often occurred at these institutions. So, so it's not to say everyone, because when I did, I originally did this paper, I guess it was in 2017, or maybe it was earlier than that. Yeah, I think it was 2017. And Barbara Kay wrote a mm. uh, uh, article in the National Post, Post yep. um, covering this article. And, and there's this huge storm uh, that happened because people were saying, and Frances Widowson, you know, she's a genocide denier, and <laughs> she thinks that the residential schools were a good idea, um, and and that that was not what I, I I was saying that the 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 residential schools had a lot of problems with them, obviously, but um, they provided education to indigenous children that's yeah. what their their intent was to to try to uh, deal with this problem uh, of marginalization yeah. and to incorporate indigenous people into farming or the labor force or to become domestic servants so to, pro to provide with some kind of foundation so they could become part of the capitalist system mm -hmm. um, and if if they hadn't been residential schools, there would have been no education uh, right. because there was no education in indigenous communities. Right. Um, there was enculturation. There was no 
reading and writing and all those sorts of things. So, um, so that, that's kind of part of the story is trying to develop a, a, an educational system for uh, Indigenous children in the context of capitalism and Indigenous people in being in these isolated, marginalized areas. Um, and, and that was part of it too, was that um, if you didn't have Indigenous students in the boarding school environment, mm -hmm. it became very difficult to educate them because right. they were off on hunting parties and, and it, like there wasn't the structured environment that was necessary to provide the education. So of course this was done in a very coercive way and yeah. caused all sorts of difficulties. But um, but anyway, so, so so that that's kind of the work that I've done on the residential schools is about from the neo tribal renterist perspective and 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 the kinds of distortions that happen because of the the need for to create this perception that it was this malevolent genocidal activity, which of course if you if you accuse a state of genocide more transfers can be extracted on this basis. And that's the same thing with the murdered and missing Indigenous women inquiry, which I'm hoping to write a paper on next year if it gets accepted, which is, it's You're again... About it? Pardon me? Are you allowed to talk about the pay, uh, what you... Yeah, well, I, I, just, I just put an abstract into the Canadian okay. Political Science Association, uh, which I have been able to present there every year now for the last... But you never know, it might be... But I'm hoping it'll be accepted, but I'm going to look at the genocide, this, yeah. this idea about accusations of genocide and why um, that's... Before you, before you go on, can you explain to uh, our listeners who may not be aware of uh, the report, the Missing Indigenous Women and yeah. the report, can you, can you give a brief, brief outline of what it is, what it's about? Yeah, so uh, after the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, this was one of the recommendations that there be an inquiry about murdered and missing Indigenous women um, because of the the, uh, the large number of murders uh, that existed of Indigenous women compared to non-Indigenous women. Uh, and this was, uh, it was alleged that the reason for, for this was because you know of racism and in non-indigenous men you know wanting you know basically abducting indigenous women and killing them be, on a sort of a racist kind of basis that that was sort of the implication that i that i got out of what was being argued for um but the rcmp did a report on this and they 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 found i believe that 80% of the, the cases involved Indigenous men. So it was Indigenous men killing Indigenous women. But that kind of got, there was an attempt to sort of gloss over this by looking at serial killers. Um, anyway, so there's this huge study that was, you know, again, going across the country, having people um, testify about the terrible circumstances and their which is, you know, one can be very sympathetic to, you know, you know, one is always sympathetic about people who's, who've lost loved ones and so on, but that, that, that's not really all that mysterious, that there is, there's all these murders happening uh, and largely happening in Indigenous communities because of all these isolated areas. But anyway, when the report came out after doing this, you know, across the country for a couple of years, which of course, as far as I'm concerned, just more rent seeking, you know, you have whatever 50 million, a hundred million dollars to do this and people have, are paid for all these different things. And then you have this report, which has these far reaching recommendations to do more studies, which are gonna have more of the same and, and, and nothing really uh, of substance comes out of it, except for um, creating arguments, which make it, easier to extract transfers of the government. And, and what they did in the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women inquiry is that in, for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it was cultural genocide uh, was the charge um, because of the educational system uh, destroying 
indigenous languages and spirituality and so on. Um, but at the time, I, I didn't, I disagreed with that use of the word genocide because genocide generally has been used to refer to the intentional, the intent to destroy the a group, physically destroy a group uh, such as, you know, the Nazis in, in, in terms of killing Jews and so on, or the Armenian genocide, all these, it's understood that you're, you're trying to exterminate a group. Um, so putting cultural in front of it is sort of distorting what we're talking about. Um, but anyway, for the murder to missing Indigenous women inquiry, they just drop the word cultural. Oh, so really? now the now it's just genocide. So they're they're claiming, and and I haven't I haven't actually gone through the report yet. If if I'm doing this paper, I'm going to do uh, you know an analysis of this uh, the the transformation of this word genocide and how this is linked to trying to extract transfers. Um, but it's it seems to be particularly bizarre in the case of the murdered and missing Indigenous women inquiry because. Uh, most indigenous women are killed by indigenous men, so uh, genocide. So I, I'm I don't I'm, I'm I don't really know the. <clears throat> they had an actual appendix that they provided, which a whole bunch of lawyers created the case that this was genocide. Anyways, so I, I want to take a look at that and analyze it and see you know what the logic was that was used to make that claim, and. Um, I, because it's lawyers that are connected to indigenous organizations, um, I, I, I suspect rent seeking, uh, you know, an attempt to create a case for rent seeking, which I, I have seen a little bit of that argument and it's right there that, you know, compensation mm -hmm. should be made for this. And there's been more court cases that have come out of it that um, the RCMP didn't do its due diligence, and I believe it was Tony Merchant, who's one of the main uh, Aboriginal industry lawyers who's involved in all these the residential schools and so on. He's now got a big court case about suing the RCMP for, for something, you know. So this is all, this is what this is all doing. It's, it's all creating this case for lawyers to go after, you know, make various legal disputes to extract compensation and and of course indigenous people get a little bit of money out of that so so they they're on board with it yeah. but they get they get very minor amounts it's the lawyers who, who who make the big money off of all this and so they're the drivers of the whole thing and and of course the murder to missing indigenous women um there's a huge staff of lawyers i, I when I, I remember when i was looking at the staff it was several lawyers and and I, and I, it, all, anyway, there, this is all what it's all about, or a big, huge portion of it is, is this um, legal uh, case for rent seeking that goes on and, and it just continues. It's, and, and, you know, people, it's like, well, another hundred million dollars. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we're back where we started. Like we, we're not, we're not going anywhere. We're yeah. just doing this kind of circular kind of thing. So you you mentioned earlier that at the end of your book you uh, attempt to provide some sort of a solution or trade off. Yeah. What yeah. Are, what is it? What are some of the some some of them? Yeah. So and and I do sort of say at the end that uh, that that's not really what the book is 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 about because in order to solve a problem you have to be able to understand it. So mm. we haven't you know is the problem the fact that indigenous nations are need to have, have you know have lost their land and and their control over their affairs that's the parallelist position is the problem that markets uh, that we have the indian act which is stopping you know market activity which is a neoclassical economics position um, or is the problem the developmental gap that exists between hunting and gathering societies and, and modern nation states and which have been distorted by capitalism and all the capitalist kind of uh, interventions in it all um, and my, that's what my position is but everyone is operating no one is accepting my position here so uh, I you know because of that we we have to 
figure out whether those old those other two positions are valid or not. So most of my material is 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 critiquing those other two positions and saying they they don't really uh, have a uh, an understanding of the situation. But if we were to accept that it is this developmental uh, gap that is at the heart of what is happening and that the reason for the isolation that exists, then we would have to develop mechanisms to, to try to to address that. And there's a couple of things that need to be done. Um, one is a, you know, sort of a cultural development strategy, mm -hmm. uh, which requires quite a lot of planning and intervention uh, from governments to be able to do that. Um, and that is not going to be very well received in this current climate of uh, neoliberalism and you know cutting back on what it is that governments do and privatization and so on um, but education is the biggest uh, area that needs to be addressed and then the second problem is the phase out of these communities mm. so trying to develop mechanisms and, and that doesn't mean shutting them down like that, that, that can't mean that because people are are, are very very well established in these areas and, and they they can't they can't function in 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 larger centers the, the dislocation would would be horrific but we do have um and the, the case that i do mention is um, the kishashawan case which is a remote uh, community in in ontario which is on a flood plain and every year or two the community gets flooded and they've been and and so it's it's an obvious case for relocation right. to a more viable location mm -hmm. and and they've spent about ten years studying this and so on and um there was a report done that recommended moving the entire community to twenty miles or kilometers outside of Timmins, so you would just build a new community, but it would still be intact um because it would so no one would be dislocated from their community but that community would be 20 miles away from timmins and so that would mean that young people could go you know to a hockey rink and play there with other children they could go to high school in timmins and and be start to go through the integration. so that seemed to me to be a very um promising uh experiment i guess or, or it seemed to have some promise to do that anyway the neo-tribal renterist element uh, inserted itself and basically kiboshed that proposal and uh, uh, they want to move the community to still within the traditional territory oh which is as just as remote uh, right. and it's going to cost 500 million dollars to do it and I don't know if that's actually going to happen. And the other one was just to, you know, kind of put money into the community to make it, to, to you know, repair the flood control uh, thing and to put more houses in there to get rid of all the moldy houses. And and so um, I thought that was a, an opportunity to, and of course that would not be perfect. Mm -hmm. That it, it, would, it wouldn't, it would still, there'd be probably a lot of problems that would come with that, but it would be, better than the alternative it seems to me to be better than the alternative um, but the lawyers uh, working for indigenous organizations um, advise the the group the the community not to move outside their traditional territory because if you move outside your traditional territory and there's resources that are found there it's going to be very hard for you to make a claim if you've left your traditional territory so you could really see the legal minds working there. Mm. So I was really angry when I was reading that case because I thought, you know, they, ugh, it's just, that's what they're doing, the lawyers, that they want, that's, that's their bread and butter is to, you know, encourage this parallelist perspective and, and try to make all these grievances on the basis of this, these legal claims and it, it there is just no future uh, for the for people in those areas. So you know this is the problem. Trying to trying to you know that's that's the other big difficulty is wrestling 
control away from the Aboriginal industry, mm. which has a vested interest, serious vested interest in the existing system. So do you think these lawyers, like I, I wonder if these lawyers have good intentions or, you know, are they really wanting to help? Are they just being opportunistic? Yeah, it's, it's probably, you know, um, it, it can be the, you know, one doesn't have to uh, attribute um, motives, uh, problematic motives. You, 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 you know, people tend to do what's in their interests. Like it, that's, that tends to happen. So they could easily have convinced themselves mm. that this is, this is the right thing to do. But, you know, of course they, they benefit financially from it. And because of that, they're less likely to be open to criticisms of their, of, of their, uh, of, of, of what they're proposing. So, you know, that's, that's the, that's the problem when people do have an, ec you know, they have an economic interest in, in, in pursuing this and, and that, that makes them very um, opposed to any, yeah. any, any type of, and that's the whole industry. That's the nature of the whole industry is that, you know, whenever you try to, criticize what's happening you you get all the lawyers and consultants and academics and everyone who has a vested interest in the existing system really coming you know coming after you um, which is is entirely possible they're doing it because they really do believe that this is the right way to proceed mm -hmm. but it's just that their logic is completely you know, distorted by their economic interests so um, that that's the, kind of the battle, but you know this this book is kind of written for you know people who are, who who are not don't have a vested interest who, right. who who actually have some capacity to be able to sort of consider does this make sense what's mm -hmm. being argued you know like if we if we just put aside our you know wanting to bow down before you know whatever indigenous leaders say uh, and just kind of try and look at the arguments mm -hmm. is is that really does that really make sense which you know i i really don't think that it does so uh, hopefully that's 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 the audience that, that the book will appeal to it's just crazy to me how this view that you're uh, that you that you, the, the the position that you're taking is not more well known mm -hmm. that's what's just mm -hmm. crazy to me yeah <laughs> And that's because it's been buried, you know, they disrobing the Aboriginal industry, uh, as I mentioned last time we spoke. 2009? 2008, um, you know, Albert Howard and I thought it was gonna have a, a, a large impact. And, you know, it was, it's just too far outside of the, of the current discussion. Like, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, the, the current discussion is, is so irrational and so off base that, you know, it, it, it to, to to speak the truth is just it seems like a completely bizarre um, type of argument. <laughs> so, and and then there's a lot of people, you know, who uh, realize that the emperor has no clothes. Yeah. But they just they're they're benefiting off the existing system. So you know that that that's there's large vested interests, and you know that's what I'm you know I always when I'm I'm starting to feel a little bit down about everything you know you just don't have to give yourself a shake and say you know it's you know just because you happen to say something that is true that doesn't mean everyone's going to stand up and take notice like there's a huge yeah. structure of people benefiting off the existing system and and no matter how you how well argued you put forward something that that's not going to be appealing to them uh, so you know, I'm I'm hoping that they're. You know, I I think um, after the last eleven years of uh, having that argument made, the, the, this very similar argument was made in disrobing the Aboriginal industry. This this book though is more um, theoretically, it's 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 um, elaborating on the theory much more than disrobing the Aboriginal industry. So um, in terms of from an academic standpoint. I think it's going to add to the, the literature on the mm. theoretical aspect more. Um, so it should get some academic traction, mm -hmm. uh, I would think. Uh, and I'm hoping that it's 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 written. Uh, at least I've had some feedback from some of my colleagues who who say that they think it's written very clearly. So yeah. although it's academic, it's not meant to be befuddling and you know jargon filled and so on.
Um, so it, it's 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 got a lot of it's quite dense, but it, it's I it's been reworked over the last ten <laughs> over the last ten years of many many eyes on it, you know, demanding changes. So right. um, you know, it's clean. It's very very clean. So I'm hoping it, it, the theoretical aspect can be absorbed by an educated public um, and kind of get a sense of a of the uh, of the theoretical aspect behind it. So I'm hoping it's going to appeal both to the academic, the 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 um, the disinterested uh, academic mm -hmm. uh, crowd. So you know people uh, who are in policy analysis who are not connected to the Aboriginal industry, um, and uh, the members of the general public who who you know I do get a lot of emails. You know people who just they just can't understand how this is this is all not how this is continuing all the time um and so that gives a bit of like you know and i think the rent seeking aspect um is is key because you look at all these sort of mysterious arguments that are being made and and you think how how could all these arguments just be continue to be made by all these people who seem to you know be educated and have uh, you know university degrees and so on it's like well there's money to be made it's, it's there's a lot of money to be made and so that's that's a big part of it and and that 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 kind of makes things a little bit less mysterious if you can if you can see the economic interests that lie behind it all i think that that's probably what has been a big factor in 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 your arguments not being put not being given attention because you know it's if it's it's so big you know the the the, the opposing side so big so well funded yeah they don't want some you know this this argument this idea that oh no they're actually in it for yeah and and the second thing which i should mention as well which i think is a big factor is you know there most people are very sympathetic towards the terrible treatment of indigenous people and um <clears throat> these uh members of the aboriginal industry are ruthless in their accusations of racism mm -hmm. and their attempts to smear the reputation of, of people like me so um people have have painted me as a as a white supremacist and a racist Ooh. and so on <laughs> um which is very shocking i'm i'm i'm, I'm i become very thick-skinned about all this and i see it as a tactic so uh you know it doesn't it's not going to stop me from making arguments but um, a lot of people, you know, are very worried about being tarred with that brush, and so they will, they won't, they, they, they'll, they're very afraid of saying anything about it. So, um, you know, that's something that has to be made very, very clear: is that, um, you know, this book is not an anti-indigenous book. Mm -hmm. it, it's a pro-indigenous book. Mm -hmm. it, it's a pro trying to figure out a way forward that is going to enable indigenous people to be able to access, you know, the same opportunities as, as everyone else is able to offer. Um, but because the industry has been so um, vocal in smearing anyone who's a critic of them as a racist, uh, it's kind of created a chill, a serious chill in discussing uh, these matters. And, you know, I, I was hoping that with disrobing the Aboriginal industry that, that because we did explain in great detail as to why this was not, a, uh, it, it was making no claims whatsoever about race. Race has got nothing to do with it as, mm -hmm. as far as, as I'm concerned. Um, but that was just ignored. You know, because it, it's 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 inconvenient to consider that. Um, so again, there's a great detail gone into about how this has got nothing to do with any kind of racial characteristics of groups. It's got to do with um, the nature of technology and environmental factors, um, which any group with any sort of ancestry, if you put them in those conditions, that's that's going to what is going to be what's happened. So, um, so that's another kind of major obstacle. Um, but I'm hoping with all you know, just like the cultural appropriation, with all these accusations flying all over the place, um, you know, so many people are being accused of racism and white supremacy these days right. that it's losing its its sting. I, I think at least it seems to ha be happening all the time to 
all sorts of people who you, you scratch your head about how they could possibly be thought of as a, a person who was a racist. But um, so maybe that's possibly going to have some effect as well. Um, but it's really hard to tell because um, it's been a it's been a long time until, since there's been any kind of meaningful debate on mm. indigenous non indigenous mm. relations. So hopefully, hopefully, you get some traction. Um, the one last question that I had was, uh, why is the book not on Amazon? What why can't on- I, why can't I buy it on Amazon? I was trying to buy it the other day. Yeah. And it's that book has not been released, but I was like, I, th- I thought the book had released last week. It, it is on Amazon now. Oh, okay. So um, I guess it's just, they wanted to get everything stocked. Like it, it was funny. released, um, but that was, you know, it just came I, like, I believe it was Tuesday that they actually put it on Amazon. They, well, no, it was, it was, a, that was the first time uh, that I, Oh, I see. Okay. So the book itself came off the presses, I guess, Tuesday morning was when it arrived at the publishers. And, and then I, it was shipped to Mount Royal, a few copies to Mount Royal on Tuesday. So I think it just takes some time to get it. So now it is on Amazon, Amazon.ca that's available as well. The university of Ottawa press, Mm -hmm. uh, the website, I'm not quite sure. I have to talk to them about what the, you know, it should be in, I would assume, in various bookstores once yeah. they get the distribution happening. But I, I know it is, uh, uh, at least it says order, you know, it used to say pre-order, pre-order. now yeah. it says order. So I assume that switch okay. has been made now. So Well, that's good to know because I, I will definitely be getting it because I, I was planning on reading it before we had this yep. conversation. Yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't find, I mean, it, it said I couldn't buy it. So I was like, okay, I'll just have to wait then. Yeah, yeah, I believe it's ready. It is available now for our listeners who want to follow you on social media. Do you, um, I, what's the what's your social media account that they should follow? Uh, if you just, I, I'm, I, I think it's uh, Francis Widow One, or but but you just if you just went uh, Francis Widowson on Twitter, it'll pop up. I don't want to give the wrong address. Uh, okay to people but um yeah so that's so that's uh, yeah that's that's the easiest way to do it and you're active on twitter right yeah well i try to i I have a bunch of different issues that i'm uh i I usually do around a poster a day or every other that's sort of whatever topical issue is 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 occurring Um, but there's a lot of different issues that are it's not just indigenous non-indigenous relations but um to do with largely to do with freedom of expression and mm. and university the things that are happening at universities okay well francis thank you again for this thank you very much all right